Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you are welcome to this webinar about tax law webinar about tax compliance, delving into the complex landscape of compliance in taxation. Uh, so we have uh, we have a panel of we have organized a panel of serious practitioners in this field of taxation. We have Dr. Leila. We have Massim Mbithi. Uh, we have Mr. Tony Kalunji. And myself, I am called Asim Mugumi. Uh, this, this panel is going to be taking you through this afternoon's session. And I, am, I will uh, be introducing them in a few. Otherwise, we are glad to have you uh, at home as we start the session. Okay, I will start with Dr. Leila. Thank you very much. Okay. So shall I just start off with my presentation? Sorry, I uh, I wanted to first uh, read okay. your bio and introduce you. I, I apologize okay. for that. It's okay. <laughs> so Dr. Leila is the Chief Executive Officer at Leila Latif and Company Advocates, which specializes in corporate tax and transactions law. She holds a faculty position with the University of Nairobi, where she confounded with physical study, the Committee of Physical Studies to advance Africa rethinking around tax policies. She has previously taught at Warwick Law School, Cardiff University, the London School of Economics, and she holds a first class LLB from University of Nairobi, an LLM from the University of Nairobi, a master's in development and governance from the University <laughs> of this bag and a PhD in wealth creation. Uh, Dr. Leila will this this afternoon be taking us through the topic of of the complexity in tax in tax compliance globally and within the region. Dr. Leila, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just confirm for me in a moment that you're able to see my slides. Yes, I can see your slides. Okay, great. So uh, my learned friends, a very good afternoon to you all and to the Muslim lawyers who are online. I wish you a fulfilling Ramadan. So we are tackling tax compliance today. The question that arises is why is tax compliance complex? And the answer to this question can be as long as the Great Wall of China. So I will address it in two parts. Complexity at the regional level, which is the East Africa market level, and uh, complexity that arises at the international level. But first, we've always got to start with the fundamental question, um, what is tax compliance? Right. So when it comes to tax compliance, it refers to the legal act of fulfilling one's tax obligations in accordance with the applicable laws and regulations. So it therefore involves accurately reporting income, claiming appropriate deductions and credits and paying the correct amount of tax that is owed in a timely manner to the revenue authority. It is also very closely tied to employing correct accounting practices, hey? So accurate and transparent accounting happens to be the foundation of tax compliance as it ensures that financial transactions will be properly recorded, classified, and reported in accordance with the tax laws and regulations of a member state. So in uh, maintaining accurate and complete records of all financial transactions, 
These would include, you may think of income, expenses, assets, and liabilities, which would definitely include keeping receipts, invoices, bank statements, and other supporting documents, which is definitely a part of tax compliance. So when we think about tax compliance, it's also about classifying transactions according to the appropriate tax categories, such as uh, business income, capital gains, deductible expenses, or even tax credits. The correct classification ensures that the right tax treatment is then applied to each transaction. Now, what is very crucial is that tax compliance also means not engaging in tax avoidance or tax evasion schemes, which are usually designed to minimize or eliminate one's tax liability through questionable or illegal means. And there are some common methods of tax avoidance and evasion, which I'll tackle very quickly. These are, for example, under reporting income, where you fail to report all earned income, which includes cash transactions, foreign income, or income from your side hustles. It's also about falsifying receipts, where you create or alter receipts to claim false deductions or expenses, thereby reducing one's taxable income. Right. When we think about uh, what makes tax compliance where a taxpayer is not compliant is where they are also creating opaque legal vehicles. This is all about setting up complex and obscure legal structures such as trusts or shell companies to hide assets, income or beneficial ownership information from tax authorities. And it's also um, to exploiting exploiting loopholes. Right. So. When we talk about tax compliance, it's comply with your tax obligations. But tax non-compliance is where you take advantage of unintended gaps or ambiguities in the tax laws to minimize tax liability. And this is often in ways that contradicts the spirit of the law. And finally, it's all about you know, um, utilizing offshore tax havens. This is where you shift income or you advise your clients to shift income or assets to low tax or no tax jurisdictions to avoid paying taxes in, in one's country of residence. So tax compliance requires not just adherence to the rules, but also a commitment to transparency, accountability, and financial integrity. Then the next important question for us is why is tax compliance critical? There are three main things, right? And you can think about many more and you can put it on the chat. The first is that taxes collected from compliant taxpayers help finance essential public services such as healthcare and education. The second is that when you have all taxpayers comply with their tax obligations, it promotes fairness and equity in the tax system, preventing some individuals or businesses from gaining an unfair advantage over others. And finally, it's a it's that tax compliance demonstrates the most important aspects, right, in taxation, public trust in the government and its ability to effectively manage public resources, which in turn promotes social cohesion and, and uh, what we call political stability. Now, before we get into the complexity, there is the issue of responsibility. When we speak of tax compliance, on whom is the responsibility to be tax compliant? And I think it's three important uh, persons or institutions. There's the taxpayer, and then there's the tax administration. That's the domestic tax administration, and Marcy Mbithi is here representing the Kenya Revenue Authority. And then also you've got foreign tax administrations, which are really essential for exchange of tax information on the basis of international cooperation between countries. So the taxpayer can be an individual or a business, and they have a legal and moral obligation to accurately report their income. Hence, they need to be tax compliant. The responsibility is on them. For tax administration locally, um, for example, the Kenya Revenue Authority or the Tanzania Uganda Revenue Authority will be responsible for administering the tax system, importantly, providing guidance to taxpayers, processing their tax returns, conducting audits, and where a institution or a person is non-compliant to enforce penalties. And then when it comes to international cooperation, we're looking at an increasingly globalized economy. So international cooperation on taxation is really essential for ensuring tax compliance across borders. 
Now, this would involve the exchange of information between tax authorities in different countries to prevent tax evasion and other tax uh, crimes on the basis of cross-border engagement. So we've got initiatives like the OECD, Common Reporting Standards, and the Automatic exchange of information, which facilitates the sharing of financial account information between participating jurisdictions, and they also help to identify and investigate cases of, uh, of tax non-compliance. So now, let's look at how tax compliance can be complex at the East African level. And I want to use the VAT as an example to demonstrate this. So VAT is, is a consumption tax, and it's an important source of government. Uh, it, it's an important uh, yani, um, source of revenue for governments, but it can also create significant complexities for businesses in terms of tax compliance. And some of the difficulties associated with VAT compliance that we should know at the tip of our fingertips right, is, are, are these five, um, what we, I call the key areas that create tax compliance. Uh, complexity for VAT. So the first is the determining taxable transactions. Now, one of the primary challenges with VAT compliance is determining which transactions are subject to the VAT. And in general, VAT applies to the sale of goods and services, but there are often numerous exemptions, reduced rates, or special rules for certain types of transactions that the government stipulates every year in the finance bill. You've got to keep track of what these transactions are that are taxable so that the correct VAT treatment can be applied. There's also the aspect of invoicing and record keeping. So VAT compliance would require businesses to issue accurate invoices that include specific information, such as the VAT tax rate that is applied, the total amount of VAT charged, and the business's VAT registration number. Businesses must also maintain detailed records of their transactions, which include purchase invoices, sales invoices, and other supporting documentation. So if you're a lawyer and you're practicing um, accounting as well, and you're advising businesses on the sort of documentation that they should be preparing, these are the sorts of areas that you really need to keep in mind, because failure to comply with these invoicing and record keeping requirements can result in penalties or disputes with tax authorities. Then there's also the cross-border transactions. VAT compliance becomes even more complex when businesses engage in cross-border transactions. When goods or services are sold across borders, businesses must determine which country's VAT rules apply and they need to ensure whether they need to be registered for VAT in the appropriate jurisdiction or not. Right? So the complexity here will involve navigating different VAT rates, exemptions, and reporting requirements in multiple countries. Importantly is what we call the reverse charge mechanism. So in some cases, the responsibility for accounting for VAT may shift from the supplier to the customer through a mechanism known as the reverse charge. Now, this is commonly applied to cross-border transactions between businesses in different countries or to certain types of domestic transactions, such as construction services. Now, under the reverse charge mechanism, the customer accounts for both their own VAT liability and the supplier's VAT liability, adding an extra layer of complexity to VAT compliance. And finally, it's the adjustments and corrections. Now, these can make VAT compliance actually complex. You see, Record keeping then becomes more challenging as businesses must carefully document all adjustments, credit notes, returned goods, and other changes to VAT accounting. This in itself requires meticulous bookkeeping. So timing issues can arise as adjustments must be made in the appropriate VAT period. So if the original transaction and adjustment fall in different periods, this actually complicates reporting, and in and in the broader sense, it makes VAT tax compliance actually complex. So VAT compliance across borders can be particularly challenging as businesses must navigate 
uh, different VAT rules and rates in multiple jurisdictions. And this complexity is evident in the East African community. And the best way that I could explain this is by giving you a hypothetical example, because I've not been able to access um, disputes from the East Africa court to demonstrate the sort of non-compliance disputes on VAT that have been presented to the court at the moment. So let's consider a Kenyan company that manufactures and sells agricultural machinery. The company has customers in Kenya, in Uganda, in Tanzania. So when selling machinery to customers in Kenya, the company must charge VAT at the standard rate of 16%, which is Kenya's VAT rate. However, when selling machinery to customers in Uganda and Tanzania, the company must determine whether it needs to register for VAT in those countries or whether the customers will account for the VAT using the reverse mechanism, the reverse charge mechanism. So if the company determines that it needs to register for VAT in Uganda and Tanzania, it must comply with each country's registration requirements and file periodic VAT returns in each jurisdiction. The company must also ensure that its invoices include all required information that it is charging the correct VAT rate based on the specific product being sold and the applicable VAT laws in each country. Now, when importing components or maybe raw materials from suppliers in other East Africa member states, the company must also ensure that it is properly accounting for VAT in those purchases. And this may involve applying the reverse charge mechanism or claiming input tax credits, depending on the specific circumstances of each transaction. So also the fact that VAT and excise duty rates differ across the East Africa uh, community countries, it also creates further complexities. And this is where with varying rates, there is a higher risk of businesses making errors in their VAT and excise calculations, which could lead to potential disputes and penalties from the tax authorities. Now, moving on, a problematic area of tax compliance from an international taxation point of view is actually in preparing transfer pricing documentation. So, Transfer pricing documentation is a set of documents that multinational companies must maintain to prove that the prices they charge for goods, services, and intangibles transferred between their related entities in different countries are set fairly and in line with international tax regulations. The goal of transfer pricing regulations is to ensure that these transactions are conducted at arm's length meaning that the prices charged are similar to those that would be charged between unrelated parties in comparable circumstances. Now, complying with transfer pricing regulations and preparing the required documentation can actually be difficult for several reasons, which makes tax compliance actually complex. The first is that transfer pricing rules vary across countries and are often complex and subject to interpretation. The multinational corporations, they must therefore navigate a web of different regulations and ensure that their transfer pricing policies comply with the laws of each jurisdiction in which they operate. And now it's gonna be a bit more complicated because the OECD and you know our only Kenya out of the East Africa member states happens to be a member of the Global Forum, which has accepted um, signing of uh, the BEPS project. It would simply mean that when you're trying to bring in country by country reporting for each multinational corporation, it's going to end up becoming even more complex to think about what sort of highly specialized transactions need to be taxed in what particular manner and where that tax needs to be remitted. The other issue in terms of tax compliance for TP becoming complex is the lack of comparable data. Now, to demonstrate that their, that their transfer prices are at an arm's length, these multinational corporations, they've got to identify comparable transactions between unrelated parties. And sometimes finding reliable and relevant comparable data itself can be challenging especially for unique or highly specialized transactions that are taking place across the digital economy as it is today. The third is the documentation requirements. 
So most countries require multinational corporations to prepare and maintain detailed transfer pricing documentations, which includes a master file, local files, and country by country reports. And these documents must provide a comprehensive overview of the multinational corporations, global operations, transfer pricing policies, and financial results. Now, preparing this documentation in itself is complex and resource intens intensive. And finally, there's the rise of the digital economy and the increasing importance of intangible assets that have created new challenges for transfer pricing. Traditional transfer pricing methods may not adequately capture the value of intangibles or the contribution of digital activities, which would lead to non-compliance concerns. In essence, that in itself would lead to disputes between taxpayers and tax authorities. So I want to now um, end my presentation by giving you another area of tax compliance concerns. And this is with respect to the capital gains tax. And I feel that the case of Tulo Uganda Limited versus Heritage Oil, which is a 2013, the decision was given in the English courts, happens to be a very good example. So for those of you who are not familiar, the case of Tala Oil in Uganda, um, you know, is a sort of a good example of the sort of complexities that can arise in cross-border tax compliance particularly in the context of multinational corporations operating in the extractives industry in East Africa. So Tula Oil is a UK-based oil and gas exploration and production company. They entered in Uganda in 2004, and they made significant oil discoveries in the Lake Albert region. Then um, around 2010, Tula Oil agreed to sell a 50% uh, stake in its Ugandan assets to another company uh, called the Heritage Oil, which is a defendant. And it was another UK-based company, and they wanted to sell their 50% stake at about $1.4 billion. Now, this sale triggered a capital gains tax dispute between Heritage Oil and the Ugandan government. So the URA, and Tony is here, uh, argued that Heritage Oil owed $434 million in capital gains on the sale. And because it hadn't remitted that amount to URA, it was tax non-compliant. So Heritage Oil disputed this, and they claimed that the sale was not subject to the Ugandan tax because the transaction took place between two resident companies outside Uganda. Then... <laughs> The URA turned to Tula Oil, arguing that the company should have withheld the tax from its payment to Heritage Oil. And Tula Oil, initially, they resisted this demand, but eventually agreed to pay only $250 million to the Ugandan government in order to proceed with its plans to bring in its new partners. And I think it was Total and another company at that time to develop the oil fields. So Heritage Oil challenged uh, URA's assessment in the Ugandan courts and through international arbitration. So in 2013, an arbitration tribunal in London ruled in favor of the Ugandan government, finding that Heritage Oil was indeed liable to pay for the capital gains tax. Now, this case that I'm giving you, it's uh, for me, I think it was important because it highlights several key aspects of the complexity of tax compliance in cross-border transactions. Three important things. First is that in the Tala case, the dispute arose because of differing interpretations of Ugandan tax law and its applicability to the transaction between Tala oil and heritage oil. So when we have divergent interpretations of tax laws, it definitely brings in aspects of complexity. Secondly, the case underscores the importance of understanding and complying with withholding tax obligations in cross-border transactions, as Tala Oil found itself liable for the tax it had not initially withheld. So the consequences of tax non-compliance is that the penalties and the interest that occur on that would be the responsibility of the taxpayer himself. And thirdly, the Tala oil case involved a complex interplay between Uganda domestic tax law, international tax treaties, and international investment agreements. 
And this in itself highlights the need for companies to navigate multiple legal frameworks in cross-border jurisdictions. So when you have the interaction between domestic and international tax law, you've got your own national tax code, the Income Tax Act, the VAT Act. And on top of that, you also have to be familiar with what double tax treaties say, what bilateral investment agreements say between multinational corporations or businesses that are working across border of the East Africa community. It adds more nuances to the complexities when it comes to tax compliance. So finally then, um, to ensure your clients remain tax compliant, I then recommend focusing on three key areas that have been the subject of my presentation. Of course, there are more areas, but what we've discussed are VAT, transfer pricing, and um, CGT. So for the first, stay current on VAT regulations across the East Africa community. Understand the differences in rates, exemptions, and requirements for each country this will help you get your clients to navigate cross-border VAT issues and ensure their invoices and documentations are fully compliant. And then the other thing in terms of your role in ensuring your clients are tax compliant is to actually assist your clients in preparing robust transfer pricing documentations. And finally, it's very important for us as lawyers to always conduct thorough due diligence and risk assessment for cross-border deals, especially in industries like the um, extractives. And this is the end of my presentation. Over to you. Thank you very me. much, Doctor. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, doctor has um, uh, told us about the risks and I even saw a comment from Jacqueline Hinga about the new ETIMS system in Kenya and uh, she's saying that it also presents some VAT complications. So that is good food for thought. Uh, thank you very much, we appreciate. Uh, doctor talked about this Talo Uganda case and I uh, made some reference to uh, Mr. Tony Kalunji, who is also here with us. But before we can hear from Tony, let us hear uh, also get a presentation from uh, Ms. Masimbithi. Masimbithi has worked at the International Tax Office with the Kenya Revenue Authority for the last 15 years. She's the current chairperson of the Cross Border Taxation CBT Technical Committee within the African Tax Region. Masimbithi, Masimbithi sorry, sorry, has a bachelor's in Economics from the University of Nairobi, a Master's of Commerce in Finance from Strathmore University, an Executive Master's in International Tax Policy and Administration from the Berlin School of Law and Economics. She is the adjunct lecturer at, Strath lecturer at Strathmore University. She has a great deal of passion in Global South and, she has, and her capacity and resources needs to ensure the sustainability of its development goals. Uh, we are welcoming Masimbithi to make a presentation. Let us, uh, I hope, I, I, hope I, I pronounce your name correctly. Let us hear from her. <laughs> you did very well, Azimu. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, let me just share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can see the presentation. Perfect. Um, I think before I start, uh, let me let me let me stop masquerading as a tax administrator. So I have been with Kerry for the last fifteen years, but uh, that ended last week on Friday. So I am currently with an organization called the African Tax Administration Forum. So before my former employer accuses me of being in this panel, representing them, that is not the case, but I have worked for the authority. So you can trust some of the wisdom that I will share today. Um, so my presentation very simple and listening to Dr. Laila, I feel like she has done my presentation for me. 
uh, but a bit harsh, of course, on why we make laws the way we do and um, some of the considerations that ought to be taken to stem or curb some of the complexities. Um, should tax administrations do a bit more? Certainly, yes. Um, but let's just get into it. Now, in the recent past, tax administration, certainly in the region, in the world, have come to a realization that the only way to mobilize revenue very strongly is through voluntary tax compliance. So not just tax compliance, but voluntary tax compliance. In the sense that resource limitations are real, certainly in this region, capacity limitations are also real. And that means that the tax man cannot be everywhere policing everyone and making sure that every single taxpayer uh, or company out there is actually um, doing and following uh, the tax obligations and assessing themselves correctly and paying in the right money. We just do not have the capacity, not in the region, not world over, right? So in a bid to enhance voluntary tax compliance, one of the most effective ways has been through making sure that tax administrations world over, certainly in the region, are effective, right? So now, just to jump into my presentation real quick, and ideally, the ideas on this slide are not the only measures that are out here. We can never exhaust them, but let's just look at some of the key issues that tax administrators have been hard at work uh, in trying to ensure that processes are a bit easier, right? Now, the first issue and the one that is very dear to my heart and one that can never be sung enough is the idea of taxpayer education. Now, what we have realized in the past through taxpayer education is at the very least, at the very, very least, it demystifies who or what a tax administration is, right? So we have since moved from behaving like policemen and the fact that we reach out to taxpayers and tell them, kindly come to us, let's have conversations. Let's have these conversations, not 10 years into a business line. Let's have these conversations even when you're starting a business so that we can actually go through what the tax system would expect you to actually comply with and how you go about the same. So what tax administrations in the region have been doing is very simple. They have been coming up with education programs and not just education programs, but programs that are highly targeted to the specific wants and needs of a taxpayer. What that means is a tax administration has to sit down, figure out what kind of taxpayers do I have? What are their needs? Simply because one, some of the challenges facing large taxpayers may not be the ones that are facing SMEs, for example. So there's no one size that fits all in terms of solutions to the tax compliance problems. And that is why tax administrators have been tailor-making um, programs towards the specific needs of an industry, of a taxpayer segmentation, and so on and so forth. So that has been very key. And that has been very intentional, not just in the regions where offices exist, but even in mobile clinics that have been happening all around the country. Certainly, Kenya has been very hard at it. And what this particular uh, processes do is they open channels of communication, right? They simplify communication. You're able through public notices, through print or gazette or media, you're able to communicate tax obligations, changes in law, changes in the systems that we need to use going forward for tax admin procedures. And we just cannot have enough conversations, right? And over and above all that, certainly Kerry, and why I keep referring to Kerry is simply because that is where I have been for the last 15 years. This, this does not mean that URA does not do the same. This does not mean that TRA does not do the same. This is just exactly what the region has embraced in the past. KRA has opened a call center. Once again, it is not just enough to have offices in the different regions in a country. You need to have a call center where taxpayers around the world, not just in country, can call in with their queries. 
And those call centers have to have very clear and concise escalation channels. What does that mean? It means that a taxpayer who calls in with a customs query ought to very quickly be escalated to someone with customs expertise and so on and so forth. So taxpayer education for us has been very key and has been very important just simply to communicate what tax obligations you ought to be looking at, what type of reporting you ought to be making, what type of payments you ought to be making and to who and at what times and so on and so forth. Um, and it's not just taxpayer education. In the recent past, we have really um, come up with milestones throughout the tax process because you do have the tax administration process that involves the taxpayer knowing the obligation, filing the returns on time, making payments. But we also do have the tax assessment side of the same where tax administrators, administrators come in to assess um, how accurately you have actually complied to tax laws. And should there be a tax assessment, what this means is it will be put as a liability in the system. Now, why this is important, and especially for this segment is, should you object to that assessment? This goes into a dispute resolution process. So we have the tax appeals trade bureau and we have the courts. And why I'm saying we have created milestone is because we realize that taxpayer education and tax education does not just need to lie with the taxpayers themselves. It also needs to go to the judicial system as well. So we have been sensitizing and sitting down with judges, sitting down with magistrates, sitting down with everybody in the tax appeals tribunal so that we can unpack some of the complexities of the cases that they see going through um, their courts. Now, the other key issue in a bid to make life a bit simpler for the tax administrator and for the taxpayer is automation. Now, in the chat, I saw the comment about the ETMs. And I think at this point, we need to understand why tax administrations do and take the steps that they actually do. But even we get to the targeted specific systems for the specific tax heads, let's just talk about the simple system that automates your reporting, that automates how you make your payments and when you make them, that automates tax assessment procedures, that automates your own procedures and your own rights for you to object to a tax uh, assessment. And one that just helps you get a simple, very important documentation like um, tax compliance certificates, for example, right? How effective is that system in actually helping you do that? I remember back in the day when we had not automated our return processing process and come due date, which used to fall on the 30th of June, it still does for December cases anyway, we would have very long lines of site time towers that have literally overdone the infinity sign over and over again. Now that was time wasting not only for the tax administration, but also for the taxpayer. And that was just the filing. After the filing, you had to ensure that you go to a bank and you queue and you actually make your payment in case you have any tax liability. So just automating that particular process such that anyone seated anywhere can file their returns, can make their payments is very important. And it is very time saving for both parties to this particular process, right? Now, these systems can escalate into analysis tools. And why this comes full cycle is because even as a tax administration, when we are able to analyze the kind of taxpayers we have, segment them, figure out what their tax compliance issues are, then we are able to go back and tailor make very targeted specific taxpayer education programs for that particular uh, segment of taxpayer. So it, it automating systems just for the everyday tax compliance procedures is very, very important. And now enter the targeted systems for excisable goods. The, uh, precise systems for the VAT system as it were and as was explained. There are very systems that we have come up with for tracking our cargo when it is on transit throughout the region. All those systems, as much as they may seem complicated at first in the long run, and if everybody's on board, you'll realize number one, for example, the eating system. It's true there was a huge cry when it was introduced in Kenya. And I think there still is a cry as per the um, comments that I'm seeing on the chat. However, KRA has gone above and beyond, number one, to put in on their website on 
how a body should go through this process. Number two, they have made this particular process a free one in that you can download this software um, even on your smartphone if you have it, right? They have made sure that this system can help you even at the very level, be able to come up with some record of how much your sales are because it helps you with your e-invoicing. This particular system connected to ITAX, make sure that you as a trader at the end of the day, you actually have an auto, auto, um, auto-populated VAT return, right? This particular system helps the tax administrator make sure that there is no VAT that is being claimed that was not actually paid in by the supplier at the same time. So it actually uh, helps curb tax evasion in that sense. So this particular tool, when looked at why the government actually took um, the particular direction that it took, it was simply to simplify the complexities of VAT and make sure that there is visibility of transactions on both sides and that the actual VAT that is meant to be collected is collected. So sometimes before we criticize a system, we have to look at what was the rationale behind this, right? Should the government done, have done a bit better to explain itself? Maybe that is something we have to discuss, okay? But certainly automation of tax procedure processes is very beneficial for both the, the tax administration and for the taxpayers as well. Now enter the legislation and tax frameworks. Now I have narrowed this down simply because of the complexities explained by the good doctor on cross-border transactions. Now we need to be very clear about one thing. And that one thing is base erosion and profit shifting is a very serious topic world over, not just in the region. It is a very, very serious topic. It erodes our tax base. We don't get our monies. And all this is packed in investment hubs nowadays. We no longer call them tax havens. And what that does is then there is no revenue coming to us, right? We are not mobilizing revenue. We cannot be self-sustaining. And all the reasons that Dr. Lela has told us as to why we ought to actually pay our taxes. Now, if this is such a serious issue that is not only being discussed in Kenya, or in East Africa, it is being discussed world over by uh, intergovernmental bodies like the OECD, by world bodies like the UN. If this particular issue is that strong, then in country we have to have the legal tools to at the very least police that activity and try and claim back what is being lost and what is duly ours in terms of taxation. And the most obvious way, of course, of doing that when it comes to cross-border activity, how sound are your transfer pricing regulations and, uh, and laws? Are they actually able to, at the very least, start the conversation around these activities and how they're priced? Secondly, how strong are you as a jurisdiction in getting third-party information in able to verify? a cross-border transaction and see whether that you have actually secured your tax base in country. So for example, Kenya and uh, Uganda, and I think Rwanda in the region have signed up to the MAC, the Mutual Administrative Assistance Convention in Tax Matters. And what this particular multilateral instrument does is it helps you exchange information at the very least with 147 jurisdictions who have signed up to the same. Why is this important? Yes, in some of our treaties, we do have clauses that can help us exchange information and you get to verify the information in country. But because of our limited treated networks in the region, then we move simply from exchanging information with 17 countries, in the case of Kenya that has active 17 treaties to 147. And it's simply because when it comes to cross-border activity, you cannot do anything without information. It is all about information, the validity of that information. How do you verify that information in country if your laws cannot actually request for the same from a treaty partner or the, your laws cannot actually request for the same from um, a parent resident country? Right. So it is very important to actually sign up to these tools and they have helped the administration curb some of this tax evasion that we see through aggressive tax planning. Country by country reporting. Uh, this was mentioned in the previous presentation as well. We recently introduced it in Kenya last year. It is yet to become fully operational. Um, 
And certainly, I think in another two, three years of lag time, we, we will be able to see whether we have actually benefited from the exchange of these reports. The thing about Yes, it can be complicated to prepare these reports. However, once again, we cannot police cross-border activity without information. And how we actually help um, the taxpayers who this would fully be a burden is, we always work with thresholds, right? So right now we say, if you're a multinational globally that earns 750 million euros uh, annually, then you are in scope of the taxpayer who's supposed to actually file country by country reporting in Kenya. We also have legislation around anti-treaty abuse provisions. We came up with DSD laws that will actually help us police activity. Now we can see money is leaving our country. We are all watching Netflix and we are paying for it, but they have no physical presence here. So actually, how do we tax that activity? Unilateral measures, DSD, we put, our, we put in our laws. Recently, the global debate is in the, on the two-pillar solution, and amount A is on the table as having as being a solution that should help us police such activity. So, not only do we need to educate, not only do we need to automate uh, systems, but we have to have the actual laws that help us in country to secure our tax base, right? And the minute you have laws that help you secure your tax base, then tax compliance on multinationals becomes almost a given because now they know that there are punitive uh, repercussions to their actions. Now, going back to the heritage uh, case, I think in Kenya, post that case is when we started really internalizing not just CGT as a tax, but what it means to actually have an indirect transfer offshore of immovable property in country. And we actually legislated around that and we moved away from the CGT realm to the nine schedule, which actually speaks to, then did you make a net gain on immovable property in Kenya? And we have to define what do we mean by that? Mining rights, petroleum rights were all put in the immovable property. So sometimes without sound laws, then disputes will arise. And lastly, how sound and how effective is a dispute resolution mechanism? Have you embraced concepts like alternative dispute resolution mechanisms? Cases can be in court for years. So do your taxpayers have the leeway to come back in table under more flexible forums to actually come up with a solution that benefits both sides? And also, how strong are your enforcement mechanisms? It's not just enough to have all these beautiful laws, to have automated processes for everybody on the table to know what their obligation is. But in the event there is non-compliance, how effective are your enforcement mechanisms? Not just in country, but are you able to also rope in treaty partners on what we call cross-border recovery of taxes? So, not to belabor on all this, because I know there'll be a discussion after this. My last observations on this issue is very simple. Number one, the list of possible solutions can never be exhausted, not at all. Conversations have to keep going on. Conversations have to be held with all relevant stakeholders, the taxpayer, civil society, business and industry, the lawmakers themselves. We have to have these conversations as to, so, how do we make these processes easier for us? How do we make everyone comply within reasonable cost and time, right? Tax administrators do need to be capacitated so that they can actively continue to find solutions and move away from being reactive when there are evasive tendencies. Because active, um, when they're actively trying to find solutions, then we see problems even before we occur and we already have a very simple solution because we've had all these conversations with everyone concerned and everybody has given their output and you can tailor make a solution that would actually favor everyone. We need to have very strong multi-agency cooperation. Sometimes we do not need to go through the taxpayer to get information because the same same information is lying with a different ministry in country. It is lying in a different department in country. So it will be easier if tax administrators would actually use such channels to get this information so as to lessen the burden of a taxpayer replicating the same information or having to look at this information again.
And lastly, but not least, especially when it comes to cross-border activity, bilateral solutions can no longer work. Multiple transactions every day, multinationals are in too many countries that we can count. So the only solution to that is for everyone to come to the table, find a multilateral approach that will actually aid the policing of this activity, that will actually find very viable solutions around what we are now calling the allocation of taxing rights and the profits themselves. And once we do this, we will ensure that we protect our, 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 our tax base in country. So once again, we need to enhance compliance and we need to enhance compliance because we need to mobilize revenue. Without revenue, we cannot be a civilized society. It is just not possible. We have been in the past at the mercy of aid that comes with conditionality. We have been bogged down by loans that without generation of revenue cannot actually pay back. So without revenue mobilization, we cannot be a civilized society. And we need to look at it as a 360, that sometimes everybody on the table has to give so that all of us can live a civilized life. Thank you very much, Asima. And without, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much, Masi. We thank you, Masi, for your very knowledgeable presentation and how you have shown us that there is, is a there is a need to have these resources uh, collected. There's a need to, for us to pay taxes so that we stop relying on grants and loans from, from other people elsewhere. Uh, Masi has talked about, I think Masi has addressed the issue of the E-teams that was raised by Hinda in the sections, in the comments. And I think in Uganda, we have a, a similar thing called the EFRIS. And now I will uh, move to uh, the next presenter on the panel uh, called Mr. Tony Kalunji. Mr. Tony Kalunji is currently a supervisor income tax litigation and he is the risk liaison officer at the tax amendment liaison person in the legal services and board of affairs department of the Uganda Revenue Authority. He's an advocate, he's an advocate of the courts of judicature of Uganda and is a chartered governance professional, chartered secretary as international affiliate who has practiced law and tax in Uganda for over 10 years. He has an advanced diploma in international tax taxation from the Chartered Institute of tax, Taxation and MBA in oil and gas management from UC Uganda Christian University, a postgraduate diploma in tax and revenue administration from the East Africa School of Taxation, postgraduate diploma in legal practice from the Law Development Center, and a bachelor's of laws degree from McKay University. Uh, Mr. Tony Kalunji, we welcome your presentation on on the topic of the role of lawyers in building integrated frameworks for strengthening tax compliance and tax reforms. Over to you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, greetings, greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you for those uh, introductory reminds of our kind. So mine is really simple, uh, and it has been introduced by Dr. Lyle and Mercy, because I'm going to be talking about the role of lawyers in what they are presented in how you strengthen tax compliance and tax reform. So since I have uh, a few minutes, I'll dive in, and then we'll look at the questions later. So briefly, tax compliance has been defined properly by Dr. Laila, and I think I'll mainly focus on tax reform, which is a process that a state passes through when it is going to make the changes in those tax laws. Uh, but for tax compliance, and I concur with the definition by Dr. Lyle, mainly how those laws that are in place, you as a person, without deviating from them, you comply with them as far as they are concerned. By. And the processes have been explained by Dr. Lyle, how from the process of registering for a tax identification number, filing returns, compliance reviews, and then up to when you deactivate later on. So I'm going to dive into the roles of lawyers, what do they do? Now, the first point, when it comes to tax compliance and reform, in itself, as they are presented, it's complex. Tax is complex. This could be because it involves multiple disciplines. 
As a lawyer, I will say it's a creature of statute, but in the same tax laws, an accountant will look at a particular section and when they're applying it, they will, they will move miles ahead of the law. Then you have scientists who will use best judgment. You will get to, to look at different schools of thought. So what makes it complex is those disciplines. Now, what do lawyers do? The moment these are put in acts of parliament, lawyers have the first the advantage of being the first to understand it. And normally, you will see the issue advisories or how they understand it. So the, the role of the lawyer at first is they are the ones who first understand this tax compliance and reform by looking at the law and what is supposed to be done. Now, also on the reform bit, uh, every state, I think, makes sure that it is through, let's say, parliament or whichever organ is given the power to legislate that passes tax, since it's good, it's non good pro quo. Now, navigating that process of how you present a bill of parliament, how it is read, the quorum needed, the different committees that analyze that, that reform process is best understood by a lawyer because first of all, it's written down in the different laws. And secondly, if there is any step that is missed, it's normally the lawyers that will come across. So they understand that process so much so that they are first role when it comes to strengthening uh, these processes of tax compliance and tax reform. It's the lawyers who first understand it and what they have understood is what they disseminate to the, to the public. So that's the first role of the lawyer that I would state. Then secondly, these frameworks, like I said, tax is a combination of different disciplines. Now a lawyer has an advantage in that whichever way you look at it, even if you look at it as ME3 or W, if you're dealing from the tail end of enforcement, or if you're beginning from whichever angle, Lawyers have the benefit of making sure that by being the observers, then they can integrate those processes. For instance, if when it comes to tax administrations, audit processes, tax evasions, lawyers normally get a seat at the table to look through to see if what is being done is first of all in compliance with the law, or the law can be amended to fulfill what is being proposed. Facilitation, all those procedures, the lawyers come through and they, they are the ones who take the different checklists. Trust, people feel comfortable when lawyers are involved because they would normally put people into checks and balances. So lawyers are the ones who normally uh, integrate those processes. And by so doing, they are able to, to, uh, to tailor the different departments and stakeholders. And in so doing, there you will get to see tax compliance on the taxpayers because their lawyers are involved, and then also the tax administrators because there is a legal department that is there. I Meaning if you would draw two circles, if I would illustrate, lawyers would be in the middle, it's the intersection. Uh, and that's what they mainly do. Now, there is another ambit that is not talked about, uh, and mainly tax is a bit political. Is a bit political. Why? everything that is going to be passed normally, even if it's non good pro quo, but if you're the government in power, you prefer to reign on support and not on a hostile scenario. And in so doing, lawyers play a role of navigating that process. It may not be written down, but normally when you see at the point of everything, lawyers come into play. If you're talking about tax reforms, uh, lawyers will normally try to advise the challenges of the different laws from the different angles. So much that if you look at some rulings, I have the benefit of, excuse me, being in litigation, sometimes those arguments cut across in our, our pleadings or arguments where you see, or as briefly we look, you would think tax is what is stated in the law. A lawyer can argue and state and say that no, this provision that is being proposed will affect uh, people this way. Uh, so much, for instance, I'll give an example. I see my colleagues of us online. We had a case here, simple case. Our laws were saying that if, if, if a tax dispute is present, interest and penalty will continue to run. But when the matter was presented to the Court of Appeal, it reasoned 
and it went into those angles of saying, but you see, is it fair in the first place? It is not their control that the matter is in court. So there are different dynamics that even cut across in arguments where people argue human rights and tax. Others will use examples of how now you that that action by revenue collecting body is likely to affect trade. So navigating those environments, lawyers play a key role. The same comes up to policymakers and legislators and civil societies. Lawyers normally try to guide on what is permissible and what can pass. And then they themselves sometimes take the flag and they stand at the front line and they advocate. We have had many reforms that have been advocated by lawyers where they say this one is what we need to do. This one is what we need to, to cut back. So lawyers play that key role. It is not properly written down, but if you're involved in the process, that's when lawyers uh, take up those key positions. Now, this one is more home and it's more understandable, the tax legislative process. Now, this is mainly, it starts in the reform. Now, how do lawyers contribute or play a role in the tax legislative process? First of all, you have to understand, I'll use Uganda as an example, but I also hold the view that Kenya is similar. But from the process, when you're enacting a law, there are certain processes you have to follow. And the first disadvantage is that if you don't involve lawyers, you face a problem. For instance, however much you're supposed to start the process of presenting a bill of parliament, normally they call out lawyers to come and give opinions on what is going to be passed, where lawyers can, adv can advise. Uh, I'll give an example. So these cases will come across as we present. We had a case recently where our Uganda Law Society managed to successfully challenge uh, the imposition of 100,000 Ugandan shillings as stamp duty when you're renewing certificate, any certificate as a professional. Now, in that case, one of the points that, that were argued and court agreed with was that this law that was being passed was contrary to the provision of the Constitution of Uganda that says, one, uh, no law should be enacted that is intended to retrospectively affect uh, a decision of, of court. And the reason that prior to this enactment, there were cases that had been decided upon where courts were telling uh, the government that your idea of taxing professionals again uh, when they pay money to when they are getting the license was not proper. But that is just an example of how if you ignore lawyers and you don't inform the person, they may not let you know on what decision to look out for. Then the other approach would be when you involve them, because also the views they were raising in that particular case, where that it is double taxation, it is discrimination, and true, if they had raised these views earlier on before the laws were passed, it would have been it, it would have been considered and it would not have been that effect. So consultations before tax laws are passed are also important. Then the rest is sensitization. Here we have the benefit of having the East African law society, but Normally, when tax laws are passed, immediately, we normally sensitize by sharing those groups, in those groups, by telling them that as of today, this is the current legal framework that has come across. Then also, when those laws are not proper, lawyers challenge them. So from the entire legislative process in the reform, lawyers are involved. And when they do this, they involve themselves with different groups, and therefore, you can get tax compliance because the citizen is able to know what they're supposed to do and not to do. Then on compliance, it also breeds uh, from that. If a person is willing to comply, if, for instance, they get legal advisory that uh, the revenue collecting body is right on that, and normally it's the lawyers who will advise sometimes that, you know what, the tax that is being are uh, requested for is proper. So in the legislative process, lawyers also play that crucial role. That now this one is a symbol. 
uh, in Uganda, we have what we call tax agents. Now, ordinarily, we lawyers as a profession, we are allowed when the matter comes to main litigation, we can go and argue. But there is a lot of work that taxpayers uh, need before a dispute arises. It could be from uh, preparing, certifying, filing those tax returns, the request for information. They need any report by, um, for instance, let's say you are in this case, lawyers come and play that role. They can be tax agents, but even without representation or registration, they can in their own right become tax representatives. And by playing that role, they can leverage on the different dynamics in the play, and they enable the compliance by acting for those groups. And then also on the other side of tax administration, it also has lawyers. For instance, we will also engage the taxpayers on the other side to pay. So they act as both tax representatives and tax agents. Now the rest uh, a bit detailed, but the other one is tax advocacy. I would, I would equate this to civil societies. We have numerous groups and they actually play vital roles. Uh, civil societies normally, their main aim is to try to see that whatever is being done is in compliance, first of all, with the law and supports the views and wishes of the population. And it's not unusual for them to engage uh, the revenue collecting uh, body. So what do they do? In the process of tax compliance, I believe if one manages to convince civil society, and that's why most tax administration labor so much to educate civil societies and groups, when you put the message to them and they understand what tax is about, they can be able to push the message downwards. So there is that advocacy. Then the reverse, if there is none advocacy, then they are likely to put you in check. So they act as a check and balance. Sometimes they even be aggressive as go as much as fighting, um, filing matters in court to challenge. But even in the legislative process, they are invited normally in the floors of parliament to give their views. For instance, Uganda wants to pass this law. What is the view of civil society? Now, when those civil societies themselves normally, lawyers are there. For instance, our Uganda law society, maybe the, uh, the Kenya law society or these societies can take up this role in the form of clusters. They normally push for reforms. They write. They call for webinars and they engage the collecting bodies uh, to try to advocate for this. So that's the role of lawyers. So if so, you can also take on that approach. For instance, our ULS is doing that properly. Now the rest is really tax education connected to that. But here is lawyers have the benefit that they can clearly uh, educate the public. And we have seen these articles. Law firms normally do that. Once a year or after any landmark decision, they will educate the public and say, uh, maybe the court has held that so, or parliament has passed this law, or this is the change according to URA. Now, this tax education is believed uh, to create tax compliance. Why? Because when taxpayers know what they are supposed to do, it is believed that they comply or they find a way of doing it at a minimum cost. The same goes for tax reforms. They try to also educate members of, of parliament who pass these laws, and they listen to their views, take them into account uh, while in the process of, of tax reforms. Then the common one, which mainly brings food to the table, is tax dispute resolutions. Now, whichever way you look at it, the judiciary, is uh, the apex and the apex courts, all judges are lawyers uh, as a starting point. Now, even on the other side, it's interesting that the people who represent the taxpayers and the tax revenue collecting bodies will also be lawyers. Now, lawyers are involved there. Even if it's mediation, even if it's ADR, it will always be lawyers. So lawyers also take up that vital role. Now, the other one, uh, it's a bit more connected to in-house counsel, will be tax administration. 
uh, all, 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 all revenue collecting bodies normally have the legal department or something akin to that. Why? Is that in the process of administering tax, normally you want to be you yourself following a particular regime of laws, and normally lawyers in house under that role. Uh, internally, they will advise, but also externally, they will represent the organization in all the other things, let it be tax dispute resolution, the tax education that we have talked about, and the advocacy. So their lawyers uh, have a point, and normally they come through. Now the rest will be tax planning and advisory. Now normally, whereas internally, you can ask for private rulings, advance uh, price rulings, opinions or views, and in-house they, uh, they, they will tell you about it, but some of them normally have input of lawyers. For instance, if you request for some opinions, let's say private ruling or advanced price ruling, normally internally they would want an input from the lawyers themselves to try to see how it fits in with the law. Then also the other people have taken it more than the people in-house in would be the audit firms. Audit firms these days is a change, and I'll use the example of Uganda. Previously, you would think audit firms would mainly focus on accountants and auditors, but now there seems to be a shift, a shift. Of course, I understand in audit firms, after especially that scandal of uh, Enron, now they no longer allow audit firms to audit and also provide the additional service of representation. But still, you find, for instance, the top four in Uganda, they have, at the start, they have departments, and those departments have lawyers. Others have taken it far by registering as law firms that are regulated by uh, the law council and Uganda law society. So lawyers provide that sort of tax planning and advisory. And of course, if you go in advance, um, if you go in advance tax planning, you realize that most of the the famous the famous provisions, if we if we if we call them let's say tax avoidance schemes, they are being planned by many lawyers. People, you recall the the famous list that came out. There was that law firm that was it in Mauritius. I think I'm forgetting the proper name, but it was a law firm whereby just data from that law firm, that's when they were able to get. I don't know whether it was Moscow or Monsanto. It was it was a law firm. I think it's. I'm going to go with Mauritius off it, but it was that data that was gotten from that law firm, and then they were able to see the tax structures, how they would organize, set up companies there. And you realize they would represent almost all the, the Apex companies we know of. And they were actually a law firm. That would, it was a law firm that was doing that. And then, of course, uh, if you get a chance, for instance, and you can afford uh, Dr. Laila, I'm sure she can also advise on how you can navigate the waters. So lawyers play a crucial role when it comes to tax planning and uh, advisory. So briefly, those are the, the roles. The rest we'll look at them in terms of questions. But the rest, what I wanted to start with, but I decided to make it the, the end, was this. Uh, before we look at the role of the lawyers in tax compliance and tax reform, uh, uh, empirical research suggests that when you look at professions, lawyers are the least compliant, non-compliant. They are the least, sorry, they are the least compliant. And there is a challenge because you would expect that lawyers who know the law, who know the consequences, who know the advantages, will be the one who are compliant, but they are the least, least compliant. So the message today would be that whereas before lawyers, look at those roles, it would be important that they themselves are compliant. It will be funny for you to engage in those uh, 10 points we looked at, integrating, law carrying, representing people in court, yet you yourself are not compliant. So lawyers in themselves need to be compliant. Um, you will see that when it comes to most lawyers, for instance, uh, partnerships, 
at least try to comply with the income tax and file what partnerships are supposed to do. Uh, when it comes to CGT, also comply. VAT, put it on your invoice. So lawyers need to be compliant. And then, interestingly, when you look at this scenario, is that the future is now targeting the professionals themselves. Because, honestly, okay, the judges will argue that they are not, but few lawyers need to be tax compliant. At first, before you engage, in these processes where you're supporting your clients. So uh, that is it. I hope I've used only 20 minutes. I yield back. So. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it is good to see that we have about 150 attendees. And now at this point, we are going to welcome questions from the audience, comments, uh, in case you have any comments that you want to make about the presentations. Uh, we have heard from Dr. Laila, how she talked about, how she encouraged us to comply with our tax obligations and to desist from tax avoidance and tax evasion. This same, this same has been recorded by Tony, and I think he's arranging most of the lawyers on this call that uh, we need to be compliant ourselves. So uh, also we heard from Mercy, uh, who has served, who has uh, dedicated 15 years of her life to the Kenya Revenue Authority, and she shared with us her experience. I think that this has been really educating, has uh, helped us, but um, in case there's any questions, I'm seeing in the question and answer section, a question from anonymous attendee. Thank you, Mas Mbithi. My question has to regard to tax compliance laws. Uganda as a country has struggled with protection of investors where they easily evade the tax laws. The poor and illiterate carry the burden of tax compliance. What could be done to remedy the situation? A tax compliance reform is sustainable. I will leave, I will leave Mercy to answer this one. Um, thank you, Azime. And I was actually replying to that particular um, question, but I think I can take it uh, live. Now, Uganda, to my experience and knowledge, has very robust legislation when it comes to cross-border activity. What I mean is, uh, the transfer pricing guidelines are in check. Uganda was uh, one of the first pioneers of exchange of information in the continent. Um, one of the pioneers in the continent when it came to cross-border recovery of taxes. So within the authority, you do have a very aggressive tax authority. That having been said, um, does that mean that there will be some levels of non-compliance? Certainly. They do exist in Kenya, they will exist in Uganda, they will exist in the region, they will ex exist globally. And I think that is why today my biggest call for reforms, not just in Uganda, but world over is, we do need a multilateral approach to these problems because unilateral measures, I think most of us do have the systems in place and the laws in place, but now it is a step higher because multinationals are morphing, the digital space has even made this way worse. And the only way this can be tackled is through multilateral negotiations. Now, everybody on the call is aware of the latest call by developing countries world over for a new world tax convention body that will actually tackle most of what we have discussed today, right? And that is actually being formed under the UN. And I think that is actually a very solid step towards us addressing as one, as tax jurisdictions, as countries, what really ails us. And when we have a multilateral solution to this, then everything will fall in place from the laws that we need, who will help us police activity, who will help us with the following requirements. And this will be intergovernmental uh, discussions, and that should be easier as a tax compliance burden on the taxpayers. And it will be hopefully solutions that actually work. Thank you, Asini, over to you.
Thank you, Master. I see this this question from uh, the anonymous attendee who was directed to Masi, but it is uh, about Uganda as a country. So I'll give I'll give Tony from the Uganda Ro Revenue Authority a chance to say a few words about this question. How about you, Tony? Thank you, Asim. Kindly repeat uh, for me the you know, I, for some reason. Can you repeat for me the question and then I take in that case. Exactly, let me repeat the question. So the question is that as regards to tax compliance laws, Uganda as a country has struggled with the protection of investors who they easily evade the tax laws. The poor and illiterate carry the burden of tax compliance while, while the investors who are usually the rich ones are, are having tax holidays. So what could be done to remedy this situation and also a tax compliance reform sustainable? Thank you, Asima, for that question. The question uh, holds merit. Actually, there was research that was done by a well, group called Siatini that reviewed all tax uh, exemptions in Uganda that were granted and reached analysis and conclusion that they were not yielding the intended results, whereby whereas tax incentives were given in hope that, for instance, jobs or money will uh, drop down, but nothing was really yielded. So because of that, I know there is a project uh, going on, trying to revise all these tax reforms to see that, uh, for instance, uh, one, the burden is shared and that the investors don't get to, to go away. But contrary to that, is that you have to look at tax in the ambit of, let's say, the government mobilizing revenue. Tax is just one of the way. There, is, there, is, there are merits that will say, for instance, if you give uh, investors tax quality, they may create, they may not pay you the 30% let's say, corporation tax. But it could be that they will create jobs, and in those jobs that are created, pay will be paid. They could supply, they, create inter they could create interlinkages, and you end up getting money as a country as a whole instead of, of tax. Now, what can be done to try to do this? It's actually in, in, it's in a process. The first process was to review. There's a review that is being done to see that First of all, these exemptions are looked at. Uh, now that is on a national level. Other, I know country, although the question is limited to Uganda, I know uh, come, uh, countries like Kenya that even took views on their DTAs to stop some of them. Now in Uganda, it has also caused the same. But secondly to that is that currently uh, there has been some sort of activism. We have had these uh we have had intervention for instance from parliament where it called a few of those companies uh since, since it's a public record i could say it was uh let's say Shikagati, where they said we gave you these exemptions for 10 years to look at this dam so they audited it and they recommended the tax to be collected and they told them not to renew unless they are complied then the other process is to of course to amend which is tax reforms if you look at, uh, in Uganda, if you look at from 2019 to date, Uganda has, it amends its tax laws, tax laws every year, but from 2019 to date, there has been no introduction of any new tax. So we amend our laws, we are only try, we try to streamline, but we don't impose any new tax at all. So we are trying to, to see that we try to, either streamline but not impose new tax on other people. Then, however, we have tried to amend and streamline to see that we target them. For instance, Uganda, and this is in the ambit of international tax, we have now some unilateral approaches to collect tax. We have, for instance, indirect tax we try to collect from companies that have no site as here in Uganda, but we try to enforce and we are passed the law when it comes to VAT, we expect uh, indirect uh, tax to be uh, to be withheld by people who 
receive services from there. We are trying to target them. Then also here in uh, another thing I've noticed is that currently uh, there is a lot of um, sensitization that is ongoing because other people argue that one, these some exemptions that exist are not strictly limited to invest to investors. I'll take the question to mean investors. They were foreign investors. It could be that even local local investors, if you call it local content, they can also benefit from the same exemption. So sensitization that are being done, for instance, if you set up business within a specific industrial area or range, you qualify for those benefits. So that is what, what is being done in, in um, so far, but there's a lot of work that is in the pipeline and the question uh, was valid and justified. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much, Tony, for answering that question. Uh, uh, please, viewers, we can utilize the question and answer, the question and answer section of the Zoom and also the chat section in case there's any questions. I'm also seeing a hand risen by, I'm also seeing someone who has risen a hand, Tabitha Muthero. Maybe you could you could address you could address your sec, your question. You could address your question in the chat. She is not unmuted. So there is a there is a question from Bettina Okini. This one is directed to Tony Karunji and also to Dr. Latif. What strategies can law societies employ to enhance their advocacy efforts in tax reform? It appears that lawmakers and tax authorities are increasingly indifferent to their input. And even when delegations are sent, their suggestions are scarcely put into effect. Uh, I'll leave, let me I'll give the first option to Dr. Latif, to Dr. Laila, to address this question. How about you, Dr. Yeah, thanks. That's a very good question. Um, usually we feel that when we give input on tax related matters to the tax admin, it's not taken into consideration, but that's not really the case for Kenya. I don't know about other jurisdictions, but generally what works is that where you give input and the input is not implemented or even considered, we've got the constitutional court. So in Kenya, we go by our constitution. If there's any national value or principle of the constitution under Article 10 that seems to have been breached, if public participation has not been taken into account, then the recourse is always the court of law. Now, the other sort of strategies that law societies can employ, I think very crucially, is that we need to really provide evidence-based research and analysis. If we want to strengthen our advocacy efforts, then our law society should invest in evidence-based research and analysis on tax reform issues, right? This means lawyers should be able to work with academics. So the Law Society of Kenya should be able to work with the University of Nairobi or Strathmore University as well to collect this data, which is really important to provide that sort of analysis to the revenue authority to implement. So we've got to conduct studies, we've got to gather data, and we've got to develop well-reasoned arguments supported by empirical evidence. The next crucial strategy is to also try and collaborate with other stakeholders. We should think about actively collaborating with other stakeholders, such as mm -hmm. professional associations, uh, business groups, civil society is really critical. If you look at the work that the Tax Justice Network Africa is doing on the continent in regards to pushing for tax-related reforms is, is essential, is pivotal. So working together with these uh, civil society institutions and businesses and other bodies is also really important if we want to have our voices heard in terms of the changes that we want uh, in, in the tax regulations and rules coming out. So that's my two cents. Over to you. Thank, thank you very much, Doctor. I thank you for pointing out the good work that the Tax Justice Network is doing in the region, and we appreciate. Uh, I would like to recognize the attendance of our chairperson, the East Africa Law Society Tax Committee, uh, Council Sepas Birunji, and he has also commented in the comment section about the Panama Papers that were leaked by Mossack 
Fonseca, something that had, I think, skipped the presenter's mind. So now I'll give Tony, Tony Kalonji, a chance to, to also address this question since it was also given to him. What strategies can law societies employ to enhance the tax advocacy efforts in tax reform? And it also appears that lawmakers and tax authorities are increasingly indifferent to their input. And even when delegations are sent, their suggestions are scarcely put into effect. Uh, please, Tony, we over to you. Thank you, and uh, thank you to Dr. Raya for doing justice to the question. Now, from uh, from this perspective of being a tax administrator, I've noticed insights, and I'll give like examples. How what can ULS do? The first one is engagement in the process, and I'll give an example. Normally, after when at the beginning of tax, the tax amendment process. Uh, I engage in this process a lot, but normally the clerk to the parliament will issue out notices and some of them will go to ULS saying, ULS, these are the bills, or if you have any comments, bring them on board. Normally, the response is zero. There is no response. People are quiet. And I'll give an example of how the 100,000 Uganda shillings passed into the Stamp Duty Amendment Act. It was there, it was shared. But there was no response. The bill is put there. ULS is normally called to engage, but the engagement, the engagement is minimal. But it's only after the law is passed that ULS becomes active. Yet, at like several stages, they had the opportunity to do so. The first point would be to be more engaging and proactive, but not to wait when it's already done and then to try to challenge. So if they engage in the process of law reform, clearly some of these things would not miss. Because I am so sure, if you look at the Stamp Duty Act, if let's say, for instance, ULS had said, no, you're trying to pass this section, amend the Stamp Duty Act to charge us 100000 to pay this money. This is one contrary to Article 98 of the Constitution, because already the courts have held in ULS versus KCCA, that one, you can't charge us additional money since we pay, uh, for it, we, since we pay money to uh, to Uganda society and, lo and the law council. I'm sure that one parliament would have considered it, at least the legal and parliamentary affairs committee, but I don't think whether it was done. If it was done and not implemented, it is an issue. But the evidence that came out was that nothing was done. So if there is more engagement in a proactive way, not to focus on when the act is done, then it can be solved. Then secondly, the one I look at is more of honesty and hostility. I don't know where, maybe because of the litigation, but most of the approach that ULS takes, they take it in a view that on one hand, you have the government and the tax administrations, and then on one hand, you have ULS. It is not a, a versus situation. We can, everyone can collaborate with the other and we can cooperate. But when you normally approach uh, the other side in hostility, fine, you will achieve, but research shows that you achieve more when you show that you cooperate. And how is this hostility uh, seen? We have, for instance, honesty. There are, uh, there are lawyers who will comfortably issue a legal opinion when, when something, I don't want to call it basic, when it is a no, and I'll give an example. Let's say we have an issue of 30% that is paid before, that is payable before you talk, one goes to the tax appeals tribunal. And we have the apex court, let's say the Supreme Court, which has held that, you know what? This requirement is constitutional. But still, you will find an opinion circulating that because the constitutional court, which was lower, so there are opinions you receive and it, it borders on lack of honesty. So, what does this mean? It means that whenever you're invited as ULS and the positions you, you, are, you are forwarding or putting across are not. Because there is always room for honesty. And I'll give, I normally give this example in criminal law. There are two ways to argue. 
uh, or defend yourself against murder, you can say, I didn't do it, I didn't kill the person. But another person can be honest and say that I killed, but it was self-defense. I killed, but I was intoxicated. I killed, but maybe I was provoked. But, but when you totally deny the murder, yet the evidence shows that you killed, it is different from someone who agrees and then puts their defense. So there are those few issues we can we can agree upon and engage parliament and other stakeholders in a more in a way that makes them feel comfortable. Otherwise, that's why every time we speak, you create and this since this is law I'll give the example we are told that we are told you can make an argument made on three fronts. You have the pathos, legos, and ethos. So if, and it matters, that's why maybe our colleague, Senior Sepas, Virunji, if he stands across, it's possible that he can say the same thing that I'm saying, but because it is being said by him, it is likely to be respected. The same would apply maybe to Dr. Laila, or maybe Masi. There is that thing of seniority. There is a brand you create, if at all you're known to say truthful things, you're known to be objective, people can comfortably listen to you. But if you build, if you build, uh, if you build a routine of being argumentative, even on points where you can agree, then you lose, you lose what we'll call that ethos in Greek. You lose, you lose that call. And I believe we have a benefit as we learn society. Actually, we should reach a level whereby if ULS writes a letter that and that, that letter should be respected. But to reach that level, if you show previous history that you're probably not even agreeing on basic things, then you lose that. People will begin to, to doubt you. And that has brought up that ambit of where you say people don't listen. But although that is, I, I'm answering the question in a hypothetical view, but I believe when ULS presents its views, the views are listened. Just that they are listened to in while looking at the broader picture. So that is my summation, Mr. Sassin. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Tony has challenged us for, for being very, very quiet when those emails come. I think all of us on their call, we should be more proactive, especially when the issue of the hundred thousand came up uh, for the for the stamp duty for the PC, and the emails were sent prayer and everyone was quiet. But after it was passed, that's when people started running to court. Thank you, Tony, for that. So uh, I will quickly go to the next question. This one it was asked by Bettina Okinyi, and she is directing the question to. Ms. Masi Bithni, the question is that will there ever be KRA outreach to East Lai? And she loves. In other words, will KRA ever incorporate SMEs operating within diverse communities into the tax framework? There is a significant amount of tax evasion occurring in such areas. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Asimwe. But now your question actually made me get very amused. Now, our outreach program is very robust. It is actually initially in this sense. When I was talking in my presentation about the tailored approach we have on different segments of taxpayers, this is actually a very good example, simply because, and to be very practical, in Nairobi alone, we have four main stations that are actually uh, premised on the cardinal points, right? So when you're when we have mapped you in the east of Nairobi uh, region, you go to the east of Nairobi office. When we have mapped you in the south of Nairobi office, you go to the south of Nairobi office. And they're all placed in different parts of the city. Now, as far as cardinal points are concerned, there are four, and you would think that we would just stop at the four. Our easily satellite office was among the first satellite offices in Nairobi to actually be functional and it's simply because we realized for such and to use your words diverse communities we needed extra effort over and above just 
um, the normal tax administration procedures and support that you were giving the citizens and taxpayers of Nairobi. And what happened is we would even go further and that satellite office internalized exactly what approach was best to actually reach to this community. And it unpacked various issues like sometimes you cannot even go to the traders because they will not listen to you. You have to go through their leaders. So taxpayer education and facilitation in that region became, it has to be through their the community leaders even before they, we actually, they are receptive to us as a tax administration. And you would be surprised now that we actually do get some substantial revenue from that particular region. And it was all by tailor making our approach of tax administration specifically to that community. Now, to answer your question in the broader sense, do we actually incorporate other activities and other SMEs? I'll give you one last example. Back, I think five or seven or 10 years ago, I'm not quite sure, we realized that we had a very strong and robust Juakali sector. Juakali in Kenya is where we have small merchants, um, but their turnover and their trade is very high volume, but they're not formalized at all. But we actually came to realize that in themselves, they have organized themselves into small circles and communities, and they actually do all have one registration point because as a community of small traders, they figured out how to help themselves within that community. And once you understand a segment of your taxpayer base in that sense, then it's very easy for you, number one, to pick out a point to over approach, if only to start the taxpayer education, if only to net the numbers that are actually involved, if only to net the actual economic activity that is involved in such a group of people. So we do actively look at the various segmentation. So we don't just stop at these are the large taxpayers, these are the medium, these are the small. We actually drill down to what are the peculiarities of the very, very small um, traders and how best can we reach out to them and bring them into the tax bracket. We have since expanded, KRA has since expanded its, uh, its tax base expansion office. And these are some of the creative ways that they actually come up with in order to net everyone into the tax bracket. Betin, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Musil. Uh, I see in the questions section that Dr. Laila also wanted to have a go at this question. So while I allow Dr. Laila to try answering the question, I'll also read out another question that was written by Joan Atim. And she said to Dr. Laila, please comment on the cross-border cooperation when it comes to tax compliance. The almost tripartite challenge of taxpayer identification determining jurisdiction and access to records and tax collection mechanism. So I will, uh, I will allow Dr. Naina to deal with this. Mm -hmm. to um, thank you. Um, so the question that John asked, I think is really critical because when we look at the fact that we are in the age of globalization and a lot of digitalization is taking place, we've got people working in the gig economy so when it comes to issues like who really is the taxpayer and which jurisdiction can actually tax that taxpayer becomes a very complex issue to navigate. So when I was responding to John and I put my thoughts uh, on, on, her, on the Q&A as well, is that the first aspect in, in which we can address these challenges is to try in Iani in order to improve cross-border cooperation in tax matters is to tr try and really move towards automatic exchange of financial accounting information through agreements like the common reporting standard. Um, this is an OECD standard. It is not a standard that I would particularly advise African countries to adopt, but my panelists may have a very different view from myself. Another way to try and counter this cross-border cooperation challenges that John is trying to mention is also to try and clarify taxing rights and prevent double taxation through the way in which we negotiate bilateral tax treaties. 
again, I'm not a proponent of getting African countries to sign up and negotiate <laughs> tax treaties going further. But again, it, uh, it's all open to debate and we can have a different session discussing why tax treaties are not really useful for African countries. Um, Mercy touched on the MAC the Multilateral Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters, that is an effective way in which Joanne's question can be addressed. But nevertheless, all this stuff that I've said still raises the issue of the taxpayer identification, especially where we have beneficial ownership laws that countries have not yet implemented or are not even enforcing. And uh, particularly right now, like I said earlier, We've got taxpayers working in the gig economy, and this in itself is drawing on a lot of jurisdictional challenges because we have incidences where people are working on platforms and the platforms are supposed to report to the country of nationality of the person, but they're not doing so. And this is especially where teaching has become online. Money is being paid and there is no the tax the uh, tax is not being remitted to the lawful um, entities. So what we need to do is we need to come up with a way in which we can get platform reporting to become an essential component in our tax legislation. I hope um, I've answered the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. I like how both Doctor and Mercy keep referring to the, the multitude of taxpayers in the gig economy, the yes. so-called Juakalis. <laughs> and uh, we have seen how uh, how the, the big need for for taxpayer education, considering that most of these taxpayers in the gig economy are not aware of their tax obligations, are not aware of, and the work that is being done by people like um, like the, the civil society. I saw it somewhere in um, Tony's presentation, and we appreciate all this. Uh, I'm seeing another question by uh, Rasana P.T. Benedict. He says, thank you. What are the doable practices that you would recommend African countries to adopt in ensuring tax compliance apart from the domestic laws and also comment, comment on double taxation treaties? I will, I will allow Dr. Lele to deal with this. Thank you. Sorry, just uh, I was so distracted by some mosquito sorry, here. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yes, the question from Rasana Pitti Rasana. Benedict. Ah, okay. Yes. All right. So I gave her a very long answer. And I think I was even trying to berate the fact that tax treaties are a bunch of nonsense, which I put there. But I think, Rasana, you're asking a very important question. What are the doable practices you would recommend African countries to adopt in ensuring the tax compliance apart from domestic laws? And then you asked me to comment on tax treaties. So my quick answer to you was that Tony had already told us when he was giving us his presentation about the need to have taxpayers education and the importance of it to ensure tax compliance. And then Mercy also talked about the, you know, the fact that tax administrations have become automated, which makes it so much easier for us to file our returns and therefore be more compliant, right? Now, on the issue of uh, tax treaties, um, I'm going to read out what I put on, on, the, on the box here. I simply say um, that African countries should carefully assess the costs and benefits of entering into such double tax treaties. While double tax treaties can provide certainty and prevent double taxation for cross-border investments, they limit a country's taxing rights and potentially facilitate tax avoidance if not completely designed and implemented. Now, our senior surface earlier on alluded to the Panama Papers and the role of the Monseca, Fonseca law firm that was more complicit in organizing um, tax structures in such a way that led to tax evasion. And the way in which they could get away with this was also for the fact that they were utilizing or they were piggybacking on the, on the what you call this, the very weak provisions that make up double tax treaties. Because some of these treaties do not have um, anti-abuse protection rules. Like they do not have uh, protection against treaty shopping. They do not have provisions which require limitations of benefits to third states from taking advantage of treaty provisions that are provided in a specific treaty between Kenya and the Netherlands, for example. 
So such treaties allow for manipulation, they allow for tax evasion, aggressive tax avoidance practices, and that in, in essence reduces the income or the revenue that any African country is able to collect, which has an impact on tax compliance. Because if I as an individual see that a multinational tax, a multinational corporation is paying minimal tax, is being provided with a number of tax incentives and exemptions, what truly is going to be motivating me to pay my little taxes to the government when a big corporate is provided with all these incentives and me with my small, medium-sized enterprise is being given nothing in terms of tax incentives. So when it comes to commenting on double taxation treaties, we've got to be very careful. I really feel we don't need to negotiate any double tra uh, tax treaties going forward. We can have a very strong domestic tax legislative framework that's going to capture how we want to treat foreign income or income that's moving beyond our borders. And Mercy had talked earlier about the fact that we have this historic awakening that has taken place on the continent. Nigeria, through the African group, moved the United Nations to say, we are done working with the OECD. We have to decolonize taxation and we need to move tax discussions to a forum that is more inclusive, that is more recognizant of country priorities and country needs. Therefore, we need to have a new tax architecture developed and designed through the United Nations level that's going to help us determine what our taxing rights across jurisdictions is going to be. So let's hold off our discussions around double tax treaties as we see the outcome at the UN level. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. I'm seeing a comment from Mispa, the manager, CIARB Rwanda. He's saying thank you all, dear speakers, for the enlightenment, and your presentations are well structured according to the theme. Thank you for your kind comment, Mispa. I'm seeing also a final question. Uh, we only have eight minutes left for this webinar. I will direct this final question to Mr. Tony Kalunji. See, this is from Felix Niyongere. Most taxpayers succumb not only to ignorance, but also to the procedure. As a professional in this field, what can we do? Uh, Tony, you presented on the lawyer, the, the role of lawyers. I direct this question to you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that really uh, procedure, procedure. There are two schools of thought. Most people tend to take the view that when it comes to tax, then procedures are mainly not necessary. But then the, the, the issue with that is that in tax, since while interpreting it, we only focus on the literal and maybe the passive rule, you find a procedure, if at all, for instance, it involves timelines to be a matter of substantive law. What can we do? Sometimes the first thing is to educate ourselves. Um, uh, when you educate yourselves, for instance, if every loop that comes out, try to do as much as you can to educate yourself. Then second, while we provide advice to these companies, you can ask for a role to do what we call uh, quality assurance, not quality control. For instance, if you incorporate a company and they pay you to incorporate it, whereas you're not allowed to ask for instruction or to advertise, you can develop a checklist and you tell them you're supposed to do this as far as taxes are con concerned. That way, you're able to assure that the entire process procedures are not skipped and done with. Then uh, they are, instead of you waiting when it, the fire has already broken out for you to bring a fire extinguisher. So you rather, construct your house in a way that you space and you prevent the things that cause the fire. Then the other way is that if at all it happens, that's what we are trained for as lawyers. Normally the law will also provide what you're supposed to do as far as procedures is concerned. Normally there are those applications you'll get of extension of time. Then there is when you can even try to use your own negotiation skills and you try to see if you can request uh, and you can pick something to be done. For instance, it's interesting that under our, for instance, I'll give an example of Uganda, we have a way of objecting 
ordinarily the law will state when you decide to decision on your object. And realize that in 1998, some gazette was issued by the Commissioner General saying all objections have to be online. But still, some people manage to object manually, which is allowed. And they say, okay, when they are told, then they are able to object online. So you can use negotiation also as a tool. But also, at the end of the day, as a lawyer, if you feel that you've reached uh, a dead end, you can try to take it up to court. And we have had many cases go to court to challenge uh, some procedures. Uh, for instance, we had they stretch back, we had those procedures of the where the law says if you're dissatisfied, you're supposed to object to the commissioner general. People successfully argued that you know what? No, even if it's not the commissioner general and we have objected to, let's say, a commissioner will receive a decision from anyone under him, since that power is delegatable, it could be the same thing. Then you also get cases where, under our East African Customs, East African Community Customs Management Act, the Yakuma, that law was saying it was crafted in a way that it was only the commissioner uh, customs who could sue, but people successfully argued that who can be sued, who you can, who can also be sued. So there is no money away, but it all boils down to pre preventing you. Educate yourself, educate the people you're representing, and you only engage in other aspects of negotiation or challenging or seeking redress in court uh, after. And since tax, tax is interesting, it changes at a very high pace. The international regime is running and then also the municipal regime is doing the same you just have to keep updating yourself because you will every year something will change as far as procedure is concerned so our role is to act uh to be the ones to take that first step and act as leading examples thank you thank you thank you very much Tony. I see our time is first spent. We've been here since 2 p.m. And the webinar closes at 4 p.m. I will, in, out of respect, allow the remaining time to uh, Council Cephas Birunji, who is the chairperson of the Taxation Committee of the East African Society, to give us closing remarks. Otherwise, I think a good thank you, heartfelt thank you from me, myself, and everyone else to the panelists, to the attendees, to the audience. Thank you very much for, for this. Uh, I'll allow, I'll allow Council Mirunji. Thank you, uh, uh, our dear moderator, Asimwe. You have done a great job. And also the all the panelists have done so, so well. You can see that it's a very active uh, chat group. Everybody is excited about all the presentations. I think... Uh, a lot of thanks has to go to Gaurel Achaye, who did all this, who put this together and looked for the team to do this work. I know that behind the scenes, Lyra was also involved in selecting the panel, and we are so happy. I think we really need to have a more interactive, not a more interactive, but a regularly interactive panel like this, as exciting as this. We need to get more topics. I know there are some people who didn't have time be presenters, so we need to get more people. I know that um, Tony is going to explain why he thinks lawyers are not paying enough taxes. We are going to hold him in box to explain to ourselves, but uh, we think we are doing well. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you. Keep paying your taxes. Thank you, East African Law Society Tax Committee. Have a good evening. Good evening. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Gabriel from the... We have one minute, Gabriel. Maybe you could close for us. Anyway, it seems Gabriel has already gone, so uh, bye everyone. It is time. Have a nice evening. Thank you.